how place is made in the frontier uh, construction. So I come with uh, three uh, different uh, dynamics that happening in that frontier uh, 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 context. Um, first is the tension between social and ecological relationship, which means uh, people who live in this kind of uh, 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 landscape tend to sort of battle with the uh, ecology and the physical physicality of the environment uh, to uh, uh, to some extent, and I will explain what 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 it is in the uh, my result. And um, also, the second relationship is the relationship between people and people between different people come come from different background. And in the frontier context, I look at the people who come from a, a post post conflict. Uh, contact and look at the people who come from a uh, political uh, history, political background, and um, mostly a focus on the background of the, the, the people who were former Khmer Rouge and the new people who moved into the place. And the third one is the relationship between uh, people and the state. Uh, uh, as mentioned earlier, there's a lot of uh, idealization of that place should be con for conservation or for um, development, therefore, a lot of different boundary that was imposed from the tops and uh, which is uh, uh, confined local uh, space in a certain way. So that, that dynamic also create another form of tension between uh, people and, and space. So um, move on to the history of the new frontier. What is the new frontier look like in Cambodia and uh, who, are, what, who, who are interacting with this kind of frontier? Um, so, Cambodian history, uh, uh, I would start from the 70s, uh, early 70s, when the uh, Khmer Rouge Revolution begins. And um, so, uh, at the same time, there was, uh, the, the, there's two, two, two uh, uh, kind of battles that uh, affect how the people move. So, there was uh, from the east, 70 to 75 in the east and uh, the, the 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 north northeast and southeast eastern part of Cambodia was bombed by the American troops and uh, and, uh, and the uh, other part of the country was uh, uh, gradually uh, taken over, taken control by the Khmer Rouge and people was moving to the city so they leave their lands and they leave their home um, then that's when the, the just the beginning of, of how relationship between people and, and, and lands uh, start to uh, be uh, shaken. Um, and then in the 70 to 7, 75 to 79, uh, the Khmer, Khmer Rouge uh, regime uh, took over the whole countries and uh, pushed people back into the rural area, but not back home, but more from the back out of the city, back to the rural area, but in different location as shown in the map in uh, on the right hand side. Um, and then in the, after the Khmer, the Khmer regime finished in 79, and uh, the whole forest area uh, of the country were, uh, uh, become the battle zones uh, between uh, uh, the Vietnamese troops and, uh, and other resistant uh, uh, groups. Uh, uh, there was still sort of a fighting uh, even the, the, the regime finished, but the, the war not, not yet finished. And then uh, uh, during that time, uh, so the Vietnamese uh, troops come to Cambodia, sort of kick the Khmer Rouge out of the, of the city and back, uh, and then a lot of them moved to the high borders. And, uh, and then, but the, the, the forest in between become the place where the, where the conflicts uh, happened. A lot of civilians, people were mobilized from the, the central part of Cambodia to the forest area and to help the Vietnamese troops uh, fight with the Khmer Rouge, uh, uh, what's so called the K5 uh, movement. Um, I won't go to detail on that. And um, the Khmer Rouge, uh, a lot of the Khmer Rouge troop uh, families uh, uh, was also not, are not living in the forest, but they were living along the Thais borders or in the refugee came uh, seeking support also from the, uh, the UN. Uh, and uh, so during the 90s, uh, uh, 90s the, uh, the Vietnamese uh, troops uh, withdraw in the 1989. 
and the Cambodia signed a, a peace agreement uh, with all the parties in the 1991. But uh, the war uh, wasn't finished just yet. Uh, the Khmer Rouge uh, withdrew from the election in 1993, uh, organized by the UN. And um, through that uh, withdrawals, uh, they, uh, they, 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 so in 1991, they, uh, they thought it was a peace and they went back home. Uh, and then in, and then in between that, they, they noticed that they, they couldn't integrate and they, they started to they withdraw and then they went back to the forest. But then, uh, back then they couldn't go to Thailand or, the, or on the border. They was, they was settling along the Thai's borders. As you can see in the maps uh, here and on the on the map here, the, all the yellow with the Khmer Rouge stronghold that was established right along the Thai borders, but primarily uh, so that if anything happened, they could uh, go back to go to Thailand, uh, seeking support or escape. Or and also there's a lot of uh, resources like uh, logs and uh, gemstone uh, along those areas so that they can. Uh, support themselves and to fight back against the uh, central government. Um, so, um, and due to this kind of availability of the resources, the war continued for another decades until um, late 1990s. Um, so, this is the also uh, not from the Khmer Rouge, also the central government also uh, use a lot of resources and the uh, uh, forest in particular. There's a look at the map here. There's a lot of Locking concession with grant all across the countries uh, at their times. Um, from uh, the, the war finished in the uh, late 1990s, so there was a big clash in the 1997, and then which uh, also forced the Khmer Rouge to uh, to integrate, and uh, in uh, 79 and until. 2000, early 2000, all fully integrated. There was no more strongholds. And uh, so those, those areas become uh, the, the, the last uh, uh, space, a landscape where, where, um, where resources are vulnerable. And also uh, it start to open up and uh, a lot of activities uh, such as conservation, uh, activities also uh, began to uh, enforce in the 1990s. Uh, they couldn't do anything <clears throat> with those places because they were occupied by the Khmer Rouge. And then, then when it opened up, development and conservation start to sort of come into those places at the same time. And look at the map here, the, the, the whole country is uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, bounded by uh, uh, cons either conservation or development, most of them are uh, uh, forested area and some of those are former uh, battle zones. Um, and then uh, locking is not yet finished, so conservation at the same time, land, land based development and also locking still continues to happen. And, that, uh, and also uh, those places become a place where uh, Land, land, uh, landless migrant from the lowlands moved there to get land because they couldn't access to land in the lowland area. So it became a place of uh, areas of potential where development, conservation, and local livelihood uh, people can improve their livelihood uh, as, to, as they hope for. Um, so that's my field work. I, as part of my PhD, that research uh, spends that was in 2013 and until 17, I spent uh, on that ethnographic research between 13 and 15. Um, I spent about six months altogether over the course of uh, two years period. And in two villages primarily called Jamkate Tabong and Samlan, those are the, the two villages I will uh, uh, show where, the, where they are. Um, and uh, it is in the, and also I spend a lot of time in the whole region to observe uh, what, what, what's going on. And I conduct uh, more than 290 interviews. Uh, some of them were repetitive interview with same people again and again. 
an informal uh, informal discussion and uh, with uh, the former Khmer Rouge and the migrants who moved there. Apart from that, I also did the uh, data collection on uh, mapping because part of my my research is on uh, look at uh, how boundaries are made by uh, uh, by maps. So I also collect a lot of um, uh, uh, secondary uh, special data. Um, uh, I did a key informant interview at uh, the village scale commune district province and national uh, level as well. Uh, Apart from the ethnographic uh, field research. The picture on the right uh, here is uh, I went to the forest and to see uh, how uh, these two guys, one of them were pretty much the former uh, Khmer militants uh, back then and then uh, he showed me what the landscape was used for and where the, how they bring the logs out, how they did the logging back then. So it's very, it is part of my research. Uh, um, Positionality. It is uh, very interesting that I uh, uh, I end up studying uh, the Khmer stronghold. I did. I didn't plan to do so. And uh, but as as a scholars, um, uh, a Cambodian scholars, it's a lot of opportunity easy for me to do research there because I'm familiar with the the, the national contact, the history, and uh, also the language. I didn't need any assistant, so it helped. Um, and also being a younger uh, scholar in Cambodia, being educated, uh, people were very uh, welcoming and appreciating. So that's helped me a lot with the research that uh, I can fit in quite well and get a lot of response and support from the local communities. The challenge is that uh, I ended up studying a Khmer Rouge stronghold. I was spending a lot of time with the former Khmer Rouge and um, it's a bit, uh, I wouldn't say hard, but it's it's it, uh, it's challenging to reconcile what I learned, what the Khmer Rouge are, who they are, and what they look like from my education and from my uh, family and parents kind of stories. And to live with them is uh, I I don't have a personal experience in the sort of the battle and with the Khmer Rouge being as a victim of the regime myself, but hearing the story and and sort of reconcile that. Uh, with my uh, myself intellectually, it was uh, an interesting process, and I spent a lot of time with them and start to uh, feel comfortable and uh, to um, to be a part of their families. So that that helped me to sort of see them from a different uh, perspective, and also helped me to do research and understand them from from uh, their point of view. And uh, also, I was uh, even though I uh, um, uh, come out person, but it's uh, see an outsider in terms of my, I came from the cities, I got education, I'm a man, so different uh, uh, sort of privilege that I, I come with. And also, um, I am, like I said, I'm not a, a first-hand war victim, so there's a generational gap. I talked to the former Khmer Rouge, a lot of them I, I couldn't emotionally uh, register. Um, so this is my side of research. So it is um, in the Northwest Cardamom, I see in the maps here, you see in the Western Cambodia, um, um, there's a red circle here, that's where it is, near Thai borders, but not on the, on the Thai borders, about 20, 30 kilometers in, inside the Cambodian territories. And uh, in the 1980s, there was the battle zones there. And, uh, 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 there was no one living there just yet. So it, uh, most of the Khmer Rouge were living along the borders and the family and the, the male, the male militant would come to the, the interior of the state to fight, uh, to those areas to fight. And then the, the children and the female of the, uh, of the Khmer Rouge uh, militant mostly uh, live along the borders. Um, and uh, the place was, uh, because of that, uh, a, a, a conflict. There's a lot of landmines which places by all sides of the conflict. The Khmer Rouge put a lot of landmines themselves. The Vietnamese troops also place a lot of landmines uh, with the support of the civilians uh, from the uh, 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 central government side. Um, so uh, in the during the peace agreements, uh, 
uh, in the 1991, the Khmer Rouge uh, decided to withdraw, so they didn't join the elections. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, in the 1991, they thought they were peace. They moved from the border back to their hometown and uh, or somewhere they can live uh, with the broader society, but uh, they, they couldn't, so that the Khmer Rouge decided to uh, move back to the forest, but still along the edge of the, uh, the Thai borders, near Thai borders, so that they can trade uh, wood and also uh, uh, seek refuge if intensive plus happened like they did in the 80s. Um, so, uh, um, but then, uh, so in, in 1990, from 1992 or 93 until late 1990, that those areas were stronghold. So all the Khmer Rouge family, uh, children and uh, middle chambers settling along the borders, um, uh, mostly depending on uh, locking uh, to, to, su to survive. Um, when the war ends, and when the conflict finally ended in nine, late 1990s, uh, that area became a potential place for uh, a virus uh, activity project and different actors came. So it's a conservation areas, uh, uh, it's a development areas, and uh, a lot of concession, land concession with the ground there for, uh, uh, specifically, there's two mining, one mining concession, uh, economic land, two economic land concession, and one special economic zone that's uh, pretty much uh, uh, granted there. Um, uh, a lot of people from the lowland moved to that area to uh, do cash crops like corns, and uh, some of them also engage in uh, uh, logging activities uh, there. And the area now is covered by also a protected area for Phnom Sanh Wildlife Sanctuary, and another one is Central Cardamom Mountains and National Parks. Um, that's a site. So the map show here is the this is the whole the the black circle is the whole Cardamom region, and the uh, the blue circle inside is the uh, northwest Cardamom. That's what we call it, and uh, these two villages that I study is in the circle there. So one of them is inside the mining concessions, and the other one is trapped in between two economic uh, land concessions. So um, in that regard, there's special kind of uh, contestation uh, in those two villages are quite uh, high. Um, who are the people who live there? Um, so. First of all, uh, it is the form of the Khmer Rouge, that area, the northwest, Kadamung there. Um, so uh, I talked to the, just look at the picture here, there's a family I live with. So um, there's a picture of the, uh, the woman, uh, the, the wife with the Khmer Rouge dress and with the Photoshop of the sort of big city at the background, kind of uh, try to integrate in the modern world in some way. Um, so it's a place where they can access to land and resources. Uh, um, I got a quote from the man in the photo here. He, he, he told me about um, what uh, Paul Pot told him uh, in the 1991 why land is important to survive. And he said, uh, he said, he said, Paul Pot said, from now on, uh, no one would help us anymore. You need to settle down by yourself on land and water where you can do farming. Wherever there's water and land, you won't die. Therefore, when you integrate with the outside society, you need land and water. And uh, it reflects on how, how land is important to him and, and how, how we chose to live there. If we move back to his hometown, uh, there won't be any land left there. So he chose to live there, which is a very wise decision. Um, and it's also a place that can stay together. Uh, they, they've been engaging in a war for so long. Uh, and then uh, some of the, the men in the photo, he was, he'd been engaging in the revolution in the 70s and, uh, and until, until uh, 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 then he, he, 
he what he know of uh, what people he know of was uh, uh, the other Khmer Rouge people in his um, sorry uh, the Khmer Rouge people that uh, joined the uh, uh, the war with him. So there's a woman also said that she never experienced anything else beside the those areas. So she's uh, uh, is 60 years old and uh, the former Khmer Rouge member chose to settle in permanently in some land because. For her, it was the only place she and her family were familiar with. She had never been back to her hometown in Swaviam or seen her family since joining the Khmer Rouge in that 75. She doesn't know if any of her family is still alive or even what her hometown is currently called. So she pretty much that's what she know of and that's what she can uh, live in. Um, and another group of people was the, the migrant who uh, who also engaged in uh, in wars uh, and seen late and also um, affected by the war until quite late. Uh, some of them were uh, joining military until you know um, 1990s, and uh, when they come back home, finished the, the military duties, all the lands are gone. They couldn't have land. Some of them live in the refugee uh, came until late, so they come back. Also, they didn't have land, or they didn't give enough land. They were not given enough land. To survive. So then, uh, when that op the frontier opened up, they also moved there and tried to get some land. It's uh, so the hope of, you know, having some a permanent a permanent place and owning the land uh, to secure their uh, their life of themselves and also their children. And uh, so, um, a lot of people said uh, a lot of new migrants frequently use, use the term "they domain," mean uh, free land or unused land or pretty much wasteland, or they pray who refer a woodland refer to the, that area where they moved into. So it's a, whole, a story of this guy who moved there. He said, uh, my hometown is uh, in uh, Kamchaimis district, Prevang province. At that time, the government mobilized young men to serve in military, therefore I was obligated to join. Since then, I have, I have left my hometown living mobile life from camp to camp, depending on my military, uh, military assignment. I went to visit my Hometown after I had left 20 years, many people I know of had already passed away. Young people don't know me. And also the land's gone, so he couldn't get any land back then. So he decided to move back <clears throat> and then find a place where he can get land. So let's move on to the uh, when, when these two groups of people move into live and start to establish life and place in that uh, former conflict, what they're facing is there's two, three dynamics that was talking about with the human and, and, and nature. <clears throat> First is human and nature. Second is between different groups, the Khmer Rouge and the new people. And the third one is between the state uh, authorities and the local uh, uh, land, uh, land use. <clears throat> so to access to land, the environmental condition of the landscape is very hostile. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot, uh, it was a Khmer Rouge stronghold, so there's, there's uh, uh, so landmines are placing there, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, you might end up uh, owning a land in the on the on the landmine, which is quite dangerous. And uh, also, uh, in a tropical forest, it's full of uh, disease such as malaria, and uh, so it's quite hard to to live there, and it's very very risky. And access to clean water also a problem. Yeah, people complain a lot about not having uh, clean water to drink, especially during the dry season. Dry season, no water, wet season, malaria. Um, yeah, so it's a lot of challenges. Uh, also, that's uh, to get land there, they have to clear forests and it takes a lot of neighbors, especially for the poor migrants who already uh, struggle uh, with their livelihood. They, they didn't come with a lot of money, so they spent all the labor on cutting forests and to get land, which is, uh, quite also another form of uh, a risk they have to take. So there's a quote from women when talking about uh, disease, I have no word to describe. Everyone in my family got sick from malaria and dysentery and the land here has malaria. So it is easy to get the malaria here. And one of the women said, I remember when my, while my husband was burning the forest at the back of the house here, I heard this, an explosions. I thought he was killed. Uh, by the mine, fortunately it wasn't. Due to this kind of uh, intense dynamic between the people and the, uh, and the land landscapes, 
um, uh, they, are, they are also exposed to uh, for the debt. A lot of them come without any money or with very, very minimal uh, money. And uh, to, to, to clear the forest, they need laborers. Uh, without labor, they don't have income. So they borrow the money from, uh, from uh, uh, those who are richer than them. And the interest rate is quite high because they don't, they don't have any other options. Some of them can be uh, up to 10% interest rate. Um, and also when they get sick, then uh, they will have to uh, uh, borrow more money and then they getting further into the debt. So the landscape itself was a lot of challenge for them to leave and to, to use land. So that's kind of create this kind of emotional response to, uh, to where they live is the sickness and isolation, they live further away. A forest in the woodland. Uh, it's a lot of fear of uh, uh, how to live there and how how they're gonna successfully clear the land and how how they're gonna pay back the debt and all of that. So that's kind of primary emotions that they create is the fear and uncertainty. Um, the other dimension is the uh, 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 the Khmer Rouge and the new migrant relationship. Khmer Rouge, former Khmer Rouge tend to have better access to land because uh, they were most of them after the integration they 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 they, they hold most of the uh, local government position up to the district. So there was back then there was district governor, commune heads, village head were all Khmer Rouge. It changed now, but back then there was just a lot of Khmer Rouge uh, on the higher position of the local government. They were familiar with the place. Uh, during the war, they know where the good lands are, they know uh, uh, where the mines were, so they know how to escape uh, from uh, the, the, the impacts of the mine. And uh, they, across, uh, through the, through the, throughout the, the period of the war, they form a strong connection among each other, which helped them to establish this sort of local power uh, uh, dynamics. And uh, they were the one who distributed the land uh, when the War finished in the 19, uh, late 1990s. They were the one who like allocating the land uh, to each other first, and whoever come after that have to somehow get the permissions or being distributed land by. In some places, they have to buy the land from the former Khmer. That is a legal kind of arrangement. So for the immigrant having limited financial capital, they uh, they have limited connection to authority. They have to buy or ask for permission to pay for the land. Otherwise, they cut the land, that they, they cut the forest, uh, claim the land that's already been claimed by uh, the, uh, other people, especially the former Khmer Rouge who live there. And they need approval to be there, otherwise they can't just uh, move and live there. So this is the lands of uh, uh, in, in migrants. So they, they normally get the land quite further away off the main road, which is quite inaccessible. And the land is quite it's kind of rocky and steep and the fertile, the, fertile, the fertility of the soil is being not as good because all the good land has been taken by the, the, the former Khmer who lived there uh, for longer and who hold the, um, the power to distribute the land. And thus the immigrants tend to uh, get the, low, the land with lower uh, production but higher cost. And they live in the higher risk of eviction. Uh, we'll talk about that later, how that's kind of why they kind of live in the high risk of eviction, because if you own the land along the, the road, which means it's classified as not for mainly for conservation, it's for local use. So you live further off the road into deep into the forest, it's considered as a, 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 a zone for development. So a zone for conservation, which is at risk of uh, eviction. So that's a uh, move to uh, the next tension is the tension between different priorities and uh, how the state view the land by putting the boundary and how the local community view and plan the land. So that in 2000, early 2000, 2010s, uh, the, the government was supported by uh, an international uh, organi conservation organization to be wider one of the wildlife sanctuary into different zones. So conservation zone, highly conservation zone, sustainable use zone, community zone. Out of that four zones, only one zone is 
allowed to allow private land type or private use of land. Other, the rest of it is for either communal use and con uh, conservation purpose. Based on that classification, is uh, more than 85% for conservation and uh, uh, about less than 10% for local community. And uh, in 2010 as well, or 2010, there's a government also grant economic land concessions and the mining concession in this area and on top of the conservation area. Um, and uh, that create another sort of boundary, abstract boundary on, on top of the land that is, but the boundary is not there on the ground for them choosing. And then uh, because of that conflict of land in 2012, the government uh, uh, introduced a very rapid land titling uh, to resolve the tensions, uh, but uh, but then only five percent of the land was classified of, of the whole district were were titled, and the rest of it is still untitled. And that uh, the status of the land uh, remain unclear. But presumably, it is uh, state land. So um, so when we talk about how people pursue those boundaries, um, they, uh, during the, the drawing of the conservation boundary, uh, uh, they asked people to join and then uh, there's a quote from a woman, they said, uh, I drew the red area as a land that has already been cleared, not the land that I was owned by, but it was owned by the villager and therefore the red zone was much smaller than the actual land I owned. At that time we had not cleared all the land just yet, so the conservation program introduced that kind of zoning activity, participatory mapping, and ask them to draw the maps where your lands are, and they say, but but instead of saying where your lands are, they said where is your farm, which means you, that you're already clear. So then they just clear some part of the land, so they were sort of trapped in this kind of participatory mapping. They lose a lot of uh, their land that they already assume that they claim as uh, their land. So that's kind of confine their space even smaller. And also another another thing is that they don't quite know where those boundaries are uh, for the conservation. For example, there is no, uh, they said there's a community forest uh, here, just over there, but I don't know where, I don't know now, they keep changing, I don't know where it is. The same thing with the land concessions. Uh, people don't tend to know very clear where those boundaries are. It is not really clear where the community land is. I think it is a place where they already clear the land. Uh, the people who lost the land uh, to the company didn't have any idea that their land is inside the company's area until the land was taken by the company. Uh, that's a uh, uh, participant uh, uh, talk about uh, the economic land concession. Um, the other one is about the money concession. Is I heard they said that there was a they, it was in the, the mining concession was in over 10 second area, uh, but I'm not sure exactly where, uh, from where to where and how big it is. I heard this about, I heard that from the student back then that was, he referred to uh, the, the, the volunteer who come to register the land. And they said the land in Okaten is located inside the mining land, so they, I can't, uh, they can't give me the land title there. So that's a lot of like, uncertainty of boundary and how to fit in. So then in order to get the land and uh, secure the land legally, and uh, the land has to be, they have to be, first of all, the person themselves who live, they have to be recognized by a local authority. The land has to be clear of forest. If they look like forest, they can't claim for it. Or it has to be cultivated as the uh, land's being used and not being overlapped with restricted conservation areas. So uh, like the zoning that I was talking about, but we don't know where, what is where. And not being located inside the public state land, like mountain, you can't own the mountainous land. You can't own the land along the river uh, and along the road. And those are also very sort of uncertainty to people. It's like, what is that public, state private? And they, they are kind of confused. And so that's, that's a, a lot of anxiety of where where they can actually own the land, and not and land not being conflict with other community member, including the concessions, 
uh, first they said the concession, they have conflict with concession, therefore they are allowed to own the land, but then the other way around, if you are in the conflict, you are not get, get the land title, which is also another confusion. So um, through this uh, history of, of the people and the place that it made, and also the dynamic everyday relationship with the land, uh, that reflects the uh, uh, post-conflict landscape as a frontier construct space where abstract boundary, imagination or potential and direct everyday experience dialectically interact. Uh, that's kind of what the frontier dynamics uh, 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 look like. And a place that produced through these dynamics is based around the fear and uncertainty, particularly uh, in relation to land access. So I, this is the last quote. Um, there's, a, there's also, um, there's a woman I met, uh, she said, there are, also, there are also many other who go there and clear for land. My son-in-law, my son, my son saw other people went there to clear the land. So he and his brother-in-law and other friends, they all were new migrants, nearby want to give them themselves a chance to get some land. Living here, if you're there, you have land. If you don't there, you have nothing. There's a woman who uh, moved there and looking for land. And that's uh, her son was sort of, there's, there's an area that's no one used yet. We can go and clear for the land there. And hopefully we own it. So I said, oh, let, let's go there. Um, and then a few months after that, I went to see her again. She said, we heard this, there's some rich people and powerful people already claimed the lands there. So we might not be able to own the land, even though we clear for it. I don't think we will own the land. I just told my son not to waste time and labor doing that. Selling labor in the farm should be enough for us to survive. That is enough for, for us. Which means that sort of that uncertainty, that history of the person, the identity they bring with, um, uh, uh, reinforce, <coughs> reinforce their imagination, reinforce the power relation that they have with land, totality, uncertainties. Uh, 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 of living in that kind of environment and place. The conclusion is that these dynamics of a place, place making the real layers of social and spatial relations, which at the local level are being shaped by economic and political change beyond the localities. The local power dynamic, local identity authorities that define how people access to land, are a product of a long national and regional political history. So my studies is contribute to the uh, discussion of uh, 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 frontier uh, proposed by the political ecologists, uh, how to understand frontiers, and uh, I propose these kind of three dynamics and also look at the history as a time dimension into it. Um, in the post-conflict, a new actor and territory involved construction of frontiers are not formed by the global and regional capital relation, but it's also a national and local political history that should be taken into account when the frontier uh, dynamic is studied. Uh, so the study also offers an alternative approach to uh, placemaking and a complex land resource contestation in the post-conflict region elsewhere in Southeast Asia. Um, I would finish my presentation here and thank for uh, listening. And any question, uh, welcome. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Chan. Uh, I'm, I think one of the first questions was actually back on one of your slides. I think it's on the, the history slide. It says like, what was the depicted on the map on the left of the slide looking at 1970 Cambodia? This one? This one? I think yes. so, yes. Which one, which one, which map are you talking about? Yeah, yes, uh, the, that, that one is the one on the left, and I guess they're wondering what, like the purple. The the purple is the is the bomb, uh, the bombs that bombed by the American troops. That was all the area that the the the, the bomb that were dropped in the country in the 70s, 70s, 75, early 70s. They're sort of showing where the the bombs were, and those areas was very unsafe. That's why it's for people to move to the city. Yeah, I remember it was called Operation Menu, I think. Um, mm -hmm. 
And then another question is, with regard to land ownership, where you elaborate on the extent of the ownership by the state, the companies, the rich people, and referring to rich people, are they from Phnom Penh? And finally, the migrants. Um, what, can you repeat the question again? Yeah, of course. So with regard to land ownership, will you elaborate the extent of ownership by the state, the companies, the rich people elaborating, are they from Phnom Penh? And then finally, the migrants. Oh, um, um, this is the very complex uh, uh, land ownerships there. And uh, it's very unsure on the grounds. Uh, the obvious one is the one the, the, the government classified the land, the private public state land and public uh, private state land and public state land, uh, no one can own it. Um, but a private state land, the state can grant it to the companies and uh, also uh, 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 also grant to the people uh, for private use. But those are not, it's a protected area and it's not very clear there. And um, the zoning purpose, you've got the, the protected area with the whole as uh, a state public state land, but then between state land, they have to divide between state public and state private. And the zoning purpose is to sort of divide those land and then it has to be classified as state private to be registered. But the registration process is a very confusing. They grant the concession first before the land is classified as public private state land. So that is also confusing. So there was no, no, no clear definition. And with, in terms of the people from Phnom Penh, uh, uh, some people uh, who know they might claim they might have bought the land from someone it can be military it can be uh, local authorities uh, there somewhere and then uh, they said this they, they should this their land but they haven't done anything with it but 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 the, uh, the local people don't don't see it uh, especially the migrant who who came from the outside get no clue who owned the land where and uh, Unless, unless they get to know the local authority and the local authority, sometimes they don't even know. Uh, so that's a sort of different layers of, of land claims there that hard to know who own the land where. And there's a power dynamic that happens uh, beyond what the local community can know or even the researcher can know what land owned by whom. Thank you, Professor Chen, uh, Dr. Chen. And um, the next question is from Thamor Fischel. And the question is, um, well, thank you for a wonderful talk. Could you tell us a bit about the pre-1970s and even pre-colonial ideas about land ownership? How did the colonial period change the ideas about land? And did the Khmer Rouge overtly overturn this? Uh, so the question again, the pre-colonial? Um, could you tell us a bit about the pre-1970 and pre-colonial ideas about land ownership and so how that the, could have well, changed? Before the colonials uh, uh, happened, the land owned by the, the king. And, uh, but back then, uh, uh, the people live uh, separate, far away from the, from the, from the, from the king, so that um, uh, they used they used the land, but uh, there was no sense of I think like a land on ownership in the sense of boundary, like putting a clear boundary of who owned the land where. And so that's a in general all lands owned by the kings. The king owned the land, and uh, but then there was no clear private ownership of who owned the land where. There's not there is no this kind of that's what I know of. And uh, then, then the colonial introduced this sort of Western modern concept of land ownership by putting the boundaries and primarily to collect tax. And, uh, and then it, uh, it didn't happen, it didn't go very smoothly. And, uh, uh, and there's a lot of uh, a rebel like a, a rebellions against this kind of system 
then that uh, uh, part of the uh, the economic revolution is uh, part is part of it is the um, the land uh, the land uh, 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 I would say land kind of revolution in in the ways that's not happy about there's the accumulation of the land among the rich and the minority powerful uh, is quite high and the poor getting less and less land. Yeah, that's the way I answer the question. Yes, uh, I'm gonna go actually to the uh, next question. For some, I'm gonna go for Miriam because for some reason I noticed that she posted it at like 8.57, but for some reason it showed up as 8.59. I don't know what happened with that. It's like jumped forward in time, but I'm gonna go to your question first. So and her it's very related to what you were discussing <laughs> right now. Yeah, the Zoom's messing with us. But um, So she, her question is, I'm sorry if you discussed this already, but I am wondering whether this area is a frontier before 1970, and I guess that you touched upon it um, kind of by explaining the actual legal implications that it was owned by the king. And is this an area, as in the area that you discussed pre-1970, an area where ethnic Khmer lived already? Did ethnic minorities live there? Or did uh, we are, Wine even exist as a settlement before the 1970s? Yeah, the, um, the whole Cardamom Mountain uh, region uh, were uh, lived by uh, different indigenous tribes. And uh, uh, some place, some, there's some, some places uh, highly uh, clearly marked uh, where, where, they, where they were. Um, but in uh, based on my research village, I I I couldn't find any evidence that uh, there was indigenous people living in those two villages. But other 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 area, other part of the of the region, yeah yeah, there there were there were uh, indigenous uh, communities lived there. Um, yeah, I, 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 I'm not suggesting that frontier is an absolute space. It was a, it's a super structured space, and uh, my, I, my, 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 my research as well is to to see how it is constructed. And uh, so, yeah, um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't a, a frontier frontiers back then. But but uh, 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 there's some evidence that locking happens. Uh, it already happened back then. But to some extent, um, I don't know. Thank you. Uh, the next question will be from um, Shorna Alred, and it's slightly different direction where the question takes us. So the question is, thank you very much for your presentation. Could you share thoughts on how you see social spatial relationship being shaped by climate change? and resource conflict that arises from that? For example, uh, the battle over the control of water resources. Uh, um, how, can you repeat the question again? So I Of course. Um, yeah. So your thoughts on uh, climate change? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And the conflict which might constrain access to water resources. Um, yeah, um, you mean the climate change that affects the community and the land there, or the, the climate change that, uh, that, that kind of water sets, this is an upland, so whatever happening to the forest there might affect the flow of the, of the water downstream. The, um, Agriculture there is an uh, is still rain feed, so climate change uh, uh, it surely impacts on the crop patterns, and uh, I think it poses a, a risk on the people who already struggle to get the land and uh, um, to to grow crop based on on rainwater, and they borrow the money they they already in debt. So if the climate change, uh, if the rain Rain is not predictable now. It is not predictable, and uh, when it was there, people complained already that they they didn't have enough rain, and they put the seed in the ground, and they borrow the money, and then the rain didn't come, and the street is destroyed, and then they and then the rain come later, and they went to the market and bought another uh, 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 bag of 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 
corn seed or sesame seed, and uh, yeah, it does impact. It does the rain, rain pattern that the kind of climate change does impact uh, local uh, livelihood there and their risk of uh, living there. That's Edna that mentioned, and also um, that area is a, a water a, a water set area is on the uh, 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 on the um, uh, upper part of the catchment, so deforestation and uh, land use there do, do affect the flow of the water on the tributary to the Tonle Sap and the farmers who live uh, down there who depend on rice farming. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, it's very complicated, obviously, with the whole water climate change relation, especially with Cambodia being still a very agrarian uh, economy. But the next question is one that I'm actually very interested in, too. It's from um, Professor Jenny Goldstein, and she's wondering if you can elaborate more on the former Khmer Rouge in Cambodia today. Does everyone know who they are? Are, are they not publicly acknowledged, or are they public about their involvement with the Khmer Rouge? First of all, they know who they are. <clears throat> they are not openly talk about it, but uh, if you if you go there to those regions, um, they call themselves former militants, and you kind of assume that you know that they were kind of most of them were Khmer Rouge militants. Um, when I talk to their younger generation, like do uh, you know your parents? Uh, your parent Khmer Rouge, they, they work in the militants, the military, they were militants. Uh, they don't call themselves Khmer Rouge, but, uh, but obviously uh, they, they living, living, being in that kind of area, I don't think they feel uh, ashamed or hide that they were former Khmer Rouge, but I think when they leave those places, they would have to be very careful how they uh, articulate themselves. And normally, uh, they just said I I, I was uh, militants, so or not uh, not having to say Khmer Rouge, just uh, militants. And uh, so that's uh, that's uh, that part of it is living there is easier for them to to articulate themselves and to be yeah to to deal with the with their backgrounds. Um, do I answer the questions? Um, well, I think the next question will be related to this one. So we'll be talking about the very similar subject. Uh, next question comes from Lisa Aronson. And so her question is, thank you so much for interesting presentation. I have two questions. Can you speak more about the shift in local power after initial resettlement? You noted that the former Khmer Rouge had local power were uh, they made into formal village chiefs and did that affect land titling? And I also wanted to ask where the rich buyers come from and how they know which areas to buy. In my own research, the villagers on the ground um, were key in this process and then sometimes misdirected the rich outside to badlands. Um, I, I find it hard to to get the question, it's very long. Um, so, how the Khmer Rouge, the shift in power affect the land titling? Is that affect land ownership? Mm, yes. Um, yeah, that like I think I think that's uh, what I what I was uh, mentioning earlier that uh, the Khmer Rouge in relation the power relation is uh, relational. I think compared to the in migrant, they have more power, but. Uh, but when the economic land concession and uh, from the top, and uh, sometimes they also uh, lose in that kind of uh, uh, I would say negotiation, it is kind of tensions. But uh, to be the local authorities, in some way, they they have a better deal uh, if the land is taken by the companies. If your village head or commune head, in some way, uh, you have a better deal. But if you don't, then uh, then you also lose, like everyone else do. Um, like uh, I talked to uh, one of the uh, uh, old, uh, former uh, general, Khmer Rouge general, who is now uh, is not in the position of power, and he loses his land. He loses all of it, and uh, and uh, and his uh, his 
friend who uh, who now in the in the power in the authority local authority official uh, couldn't do anything. They they refer to him like even him lose the power, could lose the land. So I think yeah, if you hold the position of power in the local government, you do have a better deal. But if you don't, then um, then to deal with the uh, uh, external kind of top down uh, 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 land uh, claims, then uh, would be hugely affected by that if you don't have the uh, current official or current power. Um, is there any next question? I just couldn't get it. Um, uh, or do I answer the question or that's uh, another question I'm missing because it was like a long question that I I think the miss. second part of that question was that also how local villagers interfere with rich people coming to buy and if they misdirect rich people outside um, to Badlands. Was that how people deal with people from the outside? So basically, when uh, people come from outside the area and want to buy land, do mm -hmm. local uh, people who are already in this geography, do they have or do they use any um, instruments to actually direct rich people to buy land that locals know is basically bad land? Do they misguide uh, people, rich people coming from outside? Um. I still, sorry, I still um, couldn't get the question of kind of what is the relationship between rich people from the outside or um, uh, so yeah, I, I, I think I misunderstood the um, question a bit. Dr. Chan, um, yeah. you also have a chance to read the question yourself if you want. I think it is much harder to understand the question just from hearing it. So if you click on the Q&A tab at the bottom, yeah. um, you will be able to see the question and it will be question on the very top uh, from Lisa Aronson. And it will okay. be the second half of that question. Thank you. Lisa... Aronson's, hmm, couldn't see it. Uh, I could not find it, maybe I don't know. Uh, let me just check, do you have the access to Q&A? Can you click on that and it opens in the I window? Just have to, I just asked it to the chat, oh yeah, Q&A, okay. Right, 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 okay. You have a question. Um, you have noted that the former Khmer and the local power were they made into a former village and uh, I also want to ask whether the rich buyer come from and how they know which area to buy. And uh, in my own research, the villagers of the ground were key in the process and they sometimes uh, misdirected the rich outside to bad land. Hmm. I <laughs> I don't know much about the land deals. Um, um, about the rich people from the outside. Sometimes they come to the local authorities and to buy to buy lands. And uh, the local authority who live there know know to some extent uh, within the local community who already claimed the lands where, and they would direct them to go there. Uh, but sometimes the land claim from the top that the local authority might have no ideas that who already claim the lands there. They might also get into conflicts. But um, but uh, I don't think local authority can guarantee that <laughs> um, uh, that's kind of conflict. You, you you buy the land cheap and you might have to take your own risk uh, in, in that way. I that's my I, I didn't do I didn't go very detailed on that kind of dynamic so I yeah I don't maybe I I couldn't say much about that. Mm. Where is a complicated topic when you think about so many landowners like coming into this? Yeah, so many layers of it, and uh, from yeah, 
the next question actually plays into something that I, I was kind of wondering too with, you know, obviously like Cambodian land law first came in like 2001 and then they started changing it where it's like you could have economic land conditions. Now that's not even allowed anymore. So the next question kind of plays on this ambiguity. It's from Nathan and it says, um, having poorly defined land use borders, do you think that this is a deliberate strategy of the government so that there can be flexibility in the future with land use decision-making and allocation and in order to suit the government's future interests? The land titling. Yeah. What was it? Sorry. The question is like, because there's so much ambiguity when it comes to the government and land titling, and it's also they change it all the time with new land laws and what's allowed and what's not allowed. Do you think this is deliberate by the government? It's deliberate that they want to keep it sort of unsure and ambiguous so that they can exercise their own interests in the future. Um. I, I wouldn't say so deliberately. Um, the David land issue is a complex issue and um, you might take a point opportunity out of these ambiguities, but to, to make it that ambiguous itself deliberately as uh, someone particular uh, want to do it, I don't think it's, it worked that way. But it's already ambiguous in itself. And I mean, I mean the, the history and all of this is already complex and, and there's a lot of holes in there they can take opportunity from. So I guess the, I don't think it is as deliberately designed by anyone or government per se, but I do, I do think that uh, it opportunity come along when it's, it's a bit and there's a bit of ambitious ambition in there. Thank you. Um, I know it's, um, it's nearly 9.20 here, so I wanted to ask you um, how many more questions do you want to pick up? We do have a few of them, but we also know that some people are leaving the talk because it's early morning in Southeast Asia, and so most probably people have some other commitments. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I am, I'm not having a work any commitment or any, yeah, uh, after this, so I, I can do my own work. Uh, so the next question, the next question will be coming from um, our, our graduate student here at Cornell, Huang Wu, and he's asking that um, uh, Erin Lin gave a talk here at Getty Lectures two years ago, where she talked about the different attitudes and methods that people uh, who have been in Eastern Cambodia during the war and farmers who came later deal with landmines. Have you found any simil similarity in the way um, that the former Khmer Rouge soldiers and new farmers deal with landmines in Western Cambodia? Do they take different uh, kinds of risks? Um, I don't know what uh, people in the Eastern uh, side deal with landmines. Um, in my case, um, the, the former Khmer Rouge, right after the integration, the government grant a new district there and they had to form uh, a new district center called Weobang uh, Pramag. And, uh, and then they had to clear out the access to that district. And they were, they were manually uh, took the mines out uh, with knife and uh, 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 snitch. And uh, they said, that, but they sort of roughly know where the land were along the high, along the high, along the main road. So they kind of like clear out those areas. Um, in in other places, um, I don't think they they have done a lot of like manual land mine clearing themselves. And I don't know about the east how they do it. Um, yeah. You know. Um, there's some places still mines here there and they said we haven't used this land yet, there are mines there. So thank you for that. So the next question comes from um I'm so sorry if I butcher your name, uh, Napa Karo. And it's, uh, thank you so much for your presentation, Sopak. I'm wondering if there's any dynamics or conflicts of land ownership taking place in the area with the new um, Chinese immigrants recently coming into the country. And I guess this kind of touches into some 
Chinese FDI, which is a point of contention, I understand, for this area and the country in general. By the time um, I did my research, sorry, in, uh, sorry, nine, sorry, Dr. Nine. Chen. Um, and I scrolled through the rest of questions, and, and it will be very similar questions about rights of ownership to um, Thai citizens and also um, uh, mm. concession of lands to Vietnamese. So maybe we can expand the question um, of talking of any tensions with different NGOs, international groups, Chinese, Vietnamese, and Thais. Um, from my knowledge, I, during my research, I haven't heard any sort of Chinese uh, people went there to claim for lands, no, uh, also no Vietnamese. And um, uh, the, the, econ the ERC economic land concession there were grant to mostly uh, local uh, Khmer uh, uh, elites. Um, Thai, no, I don't, I didn't see any Thai people also come to uh, buy land there, particularly in my uh, cases, in my two, the two related studies. It's a, a, a borderland, like there's a scene, like an economic, a special economic, a special zone, development zones there. And uh, uh, the casinos, um, but that, that, that is uh, like uh, infrastructures and uh, sort of urban, semi urban kind of development. That was not the, and I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time there, so I didn't quite know their land kind of situation, who owned the land, where they're. But in my two villages, there was no, there was no uh, Chinese, Thai or, yeah. How about uh, Vietnamese? I know there was some, someone asked about that there were a lot of Vietnamese who were, no, not in the Vietnamese, okay. Um, not, not in that side of the, not in that side of the countries. And how about um, international NGOs working in the area and also concerning land rights of the area? International NGO, uh, there's a conservation NGO. They work with the government. They, 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 they don't, uh, yeah, so they, one of the programs they, they support is the, um, supporting the zoning project in the, in the, from some called wildlife sanctuaries. And that was done by an international conservation NGO. That they're not the one who claimed that they were doing it. They were supporting the missile environment, a zone the, zone the, uh, the protected areas. And then the project finished now, and I don't think they, uh, their funding is uh, done. So kind of like slow, slow down in that kind of conservation uh, funding to that area. Um, most of the land registration is, uh, is a government work, is a government uh, imposed kind of projects, not, not the NGO. The next question will be from um, our alumni, uh, Maggie Jack, and Maggie Jack is saying, thank you for a wonderful talk. Could you please talk about effective relationships between former Khmer Rouge and in migrants? Is there any residu residual fear or trauma that conditions the way they share and govern space? Um, I still kind of don't really get the question. Is that a, um, how do you sorry. find the, how do you find the emotions in the relationship between former Khmer Rouge fighters and the later migrants coming to this territory? Um, that's kind of, it's it, it structure in the power dynamics that have, um, in the past, uh, I think earlier, in the beginning of the um, migration there, the Khmer uh, have a lot more uh, power than they do now. And uh, in some places, they really have to uh, um, show great respect and obey the Khmer Rouge, uh, the former Khmer Rouge authorities there. Otherwise, they, uh, not, they're not given the land. Um, Otherwise, they're not even allowed to stay there if they uh, if they don't uh, get the permission from the uh, uh, the, the Khmer Rouge, who was the local authorities. I guess the, uh, there's a power not come from just the Khmer Rouge and also come from being the government official there. Um, uh, yeah, and um, in in some ways, uh, people have some people have been in contact with this kind of 
dynamic before that as well. So some of them were involved in like, you know, blocking and, and all of that. And uh, so um, they're not being frightened by the Khmer Rouge because they were former Khmer Rouge or anything, but I, I guess it's also that uh, the authority they have over space pose a lot of um, anxiety and uh, uh, that, that where they can own the land, are they, are they owning someone's land that's someone else's land or land of the big claims. And um, yeah, I think that's uh, more about, about the, uh, the authority over lands and where you can own the land. That's uh, maybe that's uh, where the emotional kind of response to. And for the last question, it's a quick one. It's just wondering, are the public land concessions primarily for logging or are there other resources that companies are extracting from the land? Officially, it's for agricultural purpose. Um, it's not for logging, but uh, logging happens. And uh, you know that uh, I wouldn't want to sort of go on to these sort of illegal logging things that I... But there's a lot of articles saying that uh, you can go and look... Uh, what the deal of the ELCs are, and um, I wouldn't want to sort of uh, elaborate here. But there's a there's a uh, there's a, a lot of locking involved in the grounding of in the process of land clearing for economic land concession. Um, but officially, it's not for locking; it's for agricultural purpose. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, Thank you. I think that was our last question of the evening. So let me thank our wonderful speaker again, Dr. Chang, for a very interesting talk. And thank you, everybody, for staying with us, asking your questions, bearing with us for this hour and a half. I hope you enjoyed it. And yes. we're look, looking forward to welcome you back for the next Gati talk next Thursday at 12.40, daytime. Okay, good to meet you. Have a good one. Bye-bye.